So normally right here, we have a segue video, but I'm going to preach for a while before we get to the video. Um, we're, I thought I might need a Gatorade break, so we'll put the video in the middle. We're beginning a new series this week as we head up to Advent. Do you know Advent is just four weeks away? Get your Christmas shopping done now. I have a list if you'd like to know what I want, but get your Christmas shopping done now. Get busy about it. But all through the year, I hear people say things like this. Pastor, but that's just the Old Testament. Have you ever heard someone say that? Well, that's just the Old Testament. That doesn't apply to us. And so we want to uh, see the Old Testament through new eyes. For the next four weeks, why? <coughs> why does the Old Testament matter? And how should we view it? Andy Stanley created quite a firestorm in 2018 when he said this, Peter, James, and Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from their Jewish scriptures, and my friends, we must as well. In case you don't know, who is Andy Stanley? One of the most prominent nationally known evangelical pastors in our world. And he said, we need to unhitch, <coughs> excuse me, we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. He spent significant time trying to defend that position with additional indefensible theological posturing. When he said, <clears throat> I never suggested we unhitch from a passage of scripture or a specific biblical imperative. Again, I was preaching through the book of Acts chapter 15 where Peter, James, and Paul recommended that the first century church unhitch the law of Moses from the gospel being preached to the Gentiles in Antioch. Now that is a mistaken application of the text. He's encouraging and unhitching from the oral traditions that were attached to the Old Testament scriptures. He went further and told the listeners that the Old Testament should not be seen Listen to this, it should not be seen as the go-to source regarding any behavior in the church. In his view, the first century leadership of the church unhitched the church from the worldview, value system, and regulations of the Jewish scriptures. Goes on to say, so the early church, in the early church, no one ever said, the Bible says, the Bible teaches, the Bible says, the Bible teaches, because there was no Bible. But the point of your question, there was scripture, but every time we see the phrase of scripture in the New Testament, we have to stop and ask the question, what was this particular group of people referring to when there was no Bible? Now, when you think about that, you have to understand that's absolutely true, but it tells me, listen, that the New Testament revival and the New Testament church was birthed out of Old Testament revelation. That's all there was. The New Testament had not yet been formed. And then he goes on to say um, that the vast majority, virtually no one in Jesus' day could read or write. Is that true? It is true that between five and 20% of the population, it's hard to determine, were literate. So there were a lot of people that weren't literate. But when you read the Jewish writings, being able to read and write was valued. In fact, the Mishnah and Dead Sea Scrolls show Jews taught their kids to read. In fact, emphasizes that even girls start to read. So can you see how this is all being twisted to make a point that isn't true? This seems to square with the Gospels. Over 60 times, Jesus said to the Sadducees and Pharisees, have you not read... He did not say, have you not heard? He did say that to the population. You have heard that it's been said, but to the leaders, he says, have you not read? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, Jude, and Paul all wrote books of the New Testament that were highly attested to. So again, the argument is for some other purpose. How did Jesus and the early church view the Old Testament scriptures? 
The entire Bible from beginning to end is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Someone said that if you cut the Bible anywhere, it will bleed for it is red with redemption truth. <clears throat> Another commentator arguing on Andy Stanley's side said, the Bible is a 1,200 page book that doesn't introduce the main protagonist until page 939. That could not be further from the truth. Jesus is present from the beginning to the end and said so himself in John 5, 39, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but they are they which testify, they are they which testify of me. Is anyone in the house this morning? They testify of Jesus. In verse 46, he said, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me for he wrote of me. Say amen, somebody. I said, Moses wrote of Jesus. In Luke 24, 44, Jesus is on the Emmaus Road. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you and everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Later, the Emmaus Road disciples said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us about the scriptures? In John chapter one, Philip said, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, king, uh, son of Joseph. Where did he come up with that? From the Old Testament. All these scriptures agree and more that Jesus is in the Old Testament and that they testify of him. But we often miss Jesus in the Old Testament because he's not named and he appears differently in the Old Testament than he does in the New Testament. But he's definitely there and his presence makes a difference. Now why, why, why would it matter that we disconnect from the Old Testament? Because if you want to become embracing of alternate lifestyles as a Bible norm, you have to disconnect from Old Testament truth. Almost every moral principle expressed in the New Testament finds its definition in the Old Testament. And when you disconnect from the Old Testament, you miss a great revelation of who Jesus is. So there's a song, some of you will have heard, it's a little bit long, but it'll show you why we will be spiritually poverty stricken if we disconnect from Old Testament truth. Woo! Do not take the Old Testament away from me. From beginning to end, it testifies of Jesus. So I want you to see this morning three, what are called Christophanies, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. How do we know it's Christ? We know that the angel of the Lord, when he receives worship, cannot be an angel because angels cannot receive worship. And you find that clearly in the book of Revelation. There are times when Jesus appears as God, receives worship as God, to speak into the lives of God's people in a very real and powerful way. And the first of those is Hagar. We will, see the, we will see Jesus as this, the God who sees, the God who sees. Now, boy, this could be a whole sermon by itself, but I'm gonna walk through it. God had given a promise to Abraham that his seed would be as, um, as the sands of the sea or the stars of the sky. In chapter 12 of Genesis, God promised Abraham he'd be the father of a great nation. In chapter 15, Abraham doesn't have a child. He's getting old. And he says to God, I don't have a son, <clears throat> but the eldest servant in my household is Eleazar. And if you don't give me a son, then Eleazar becomes my, my heritage. Is that what you want? Because he's not my son and God says no. 
It will be a son of your own flesh and blood. Chapter 16. Sarah is hearing this, and I'm going to be a little bit easy on Sarah here because it was a different economy, different time frame, all of that. But she heard God say that the son of promise would come from Abraham. And so she said, well, I'm well past childbearing years. And the seed, the, end, the, the lineage will come through you, Abraham. So maybe what we should do is have you take Hagar as a concubine or a second wife and have a child with her because then the seed will still be through Abraham and Abraham agrees. <laughs> oh, there's a message right there. <laughs> and Hagar has a child. Guess what happens? Jealousy. Because now Hagar, hi Sarah, you like my baby? This is my baby in Abraham's. And Sarah thinks, I wish I could kill you and tell God you died. Because the tension grows between them over this child that was not the will of God. And that becomes clear later. Anytime you try to fulfill the promise of God in the power of the flesh, you create the Middle East. So Sarah is, <coughs> Sarah is being mean to Hagar. And Sarah comes to Abraham and says, what do I do with her? She's being disrespectful. This has given her a power that I don't think she should have. And Abraham, even though he was a friend of God and loved God, didn't always stand up where he should. And he says, Sarah, <laughs> do whatever you want with her. So Sarah kicks her out. At this juncture, Hagar flees. She's near a spring in the desert, but has no other resources. And the angel of the Lord <laughs> appears to her and says, tell me your story. Why are you here? Did the angel of the Lord know? Yes, but you know, sometimes... We need to tell God what we know so that we can be accountable for our own thoughts and our own positions. <clears throat> she tells the story, and here's what the angel says. Return and submit. <laughs> Do you know that the will of God for your life isn't always going to be pleasant? That sometimes it won't even seem fair to you. If I were Hagar and the angel Lord appeared, I would have thought, now you're gonna think I'm cruel, but I don't know how, oh, believe me, I do not know how women think. Just, I'm not suggesting that at all. But human nature might be that she would have said, you know, angel of the Lord, if you would just kill Sarah, that fixes everything. Hello? Well, what wouldn't it? Don't look at me like that. You've thought that about your neighbor. Don't give me this, this look like, oh, I don't, I don't think she would think that way. You thought that about the guy that cut you off in traffic. Well, don't, don't play games with me. And God says, no. Sometimes you have to live with the consequences of your action if you want to move in the place of God's blessing. You did this, Hagar. You are a willing participant. You knew this was not the plan and you're gonna go back home and dwell there. But then the angel of the Lord gives a promise. I will increase your descendants and they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, about Ishmael, 
He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. He'll be a fighter. You won't have to worry about being protected. He's going to be a fighter. I will take care of you. And Hagar responds this way in verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord. So the angel Lord appears, tells her to go back. Your son is gonna, I'm gonna bless your offspring and they're gonna be people of power and fighters. And she said, she gave this name, no longer says the angel of the Lord. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. I have now seen the one. (laughs) I've now seen the one who sees me. Have you ever been in a mess of your own creation and could not see a way out of it. Hold up your neighbor's hand. (laughs) And afraid that God would not help you because of the mess you created. God's not gonna help you. You're on your own. I'm not gonna care for you. And you feel like you're in the desert by yourself without resources. Everyone has been unfair to me, but the Christ of the Old Testament is revealed to us as the one who sees us. When we're at our lowest, when we're in our despair, when we're broken, when we've failed, the angel of the Lord will appear to you and give you a pathway forward because he is the God who sees us. You might think he never sees you, but he always sees you. If he can see Hagar, he sees you. Second, he's not only the God who sees, he's the God who saves. Now, I love this story of the three Hebrews and the fiery furnace. Anybody else in the house? Like I said, if I have to shout myself down, it's going to take a while. And you know the story that they were told if when the music played, if they didn't bow, they were going to be burned. They were going to die. And they refused to bow. And so I want to take you to that point in the story and maybe give you another way to view this than how it is normally preached. And so you can believe whatever you want to believe, but I'm going to tell you the right way because I think it gets told wrongly. (coughs) Now, if you're ready at the time when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I've made, good. But if you do not worship, you'll be cast immediately into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O king Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand. So let's take the two things they say. They did not say God will deliver us from the furnace. They said God is able to deliver us from the furnace. And they knew that whatever happened, God would deliver them out of the hand of the king. That whatever happens, if they die or live, they would not be in the hand of the king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image. And it's often preached the but if not. Our God is able, our God will, but if he doesn't, what sense does that make? Our God can, our God will, but in case he doesn't. I don't think they were saying in case God doesn't deliver us. If you take the structure and put it in next to the verses that are ahead, here's what I think they were saying. We are not gonna bow. And our God can deliver us from the fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, but if not what? But if you don't put us in the fiery furnace, but if you don't follow through on what you're gonna say, it doesn't matter. Because whether you throw us in or you don't throw us in, we're not gonna bow. Are you hearing me? 
I believe that's the kind of faith they had. We will not bow. Doesn't matter. Your threats have no impact on us. They have no power over us. Because if he can, and he will deliver us out of your hand, but whatever happens, oh Lord Jesus, give us some saints of the most high God that will serve him regardless of the consequence. Oh, churches are filled with Pentecostal cupcakes. We serve Jesus to be blessed. We serve Jesus to be delivered. We tithe so the windows of heaven will open. We tie everything to what we get. But I heard someone say once, if I never experienced another blessing of God, if I never saw another miracle of God, if I never saw another display of his power, I would still believe that he loves me because I saw him stretch his arms and hang on that cross and die for me. And his stretched arms are enough for me to make it all the way through, I trust him. But if not, it doesn't matter, King. Babble all you want. But then the story gets better. He gets really ticked off, heats it up more. The soldiers that throw them in are killed. And the Bible says they fell down into the flames. And I'm just telling you, King Nebuchadnezzar rose in haste. Can you imagine this? Come on, imagine you're there. Didn't we not cast three men into the fire? True king. (laughs) And I'm not taking the newer renditions of this verse. I'm going to give you the right one. True, O king, look. I see, (laughs) I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt, and the fourth, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. There are times that the world will only see the glory of God when you get thrown into the fiery furnace, and I can assure you that the God of the Old Testament is sad. He will be with you in the furnace. He'll be with you in the flame. He'll be with you in the trial. You will never walk alone. He will walk by your side. Fourth man, I can, I can just imagine. I don't know how many times he counted, but every time he counted, he knew we, you want divine math? We threw in three and God sent in a fourth. Church, hear me. He will always be with you in the flame. He will always be with you in the flame. That's the God of the Old Testament. Story that is amazing. Don't forget that he's with you in the flame. He's the God who sees and he's the God who saves. And here's how it is summed up. And the satraps, administrators, governors, the king's counselors gathered together and they saw these men on whose body the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor their garments affected and the smell of fire was not on them. That's shouting ground. Now I'll tell you, that is not natural. One year at Christmas time, we were down at my in-laws and my brother-in-law and I got this bright idea to burn a, 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 a bonfire with gasoline. I dumped the gasoline in, it ran down in it. We couldn't get it to light, couldn't find it. So what do you do? You get more gasoline. (laughs) 
So we decided to do a wick. Now I had a better idea. Let's douse with gasoline and get back with a flaming arrow and shoot it. But my brother-in-law thought that was a bad idea. So we have this gas wick, just like you see on TV, right? You see the wick of, of fuel and it slowly goes and that's not how that works. <laughs> he has this torch and this is what I hear. Where is the, boom! My body is saying, you should be running right now. And when I looked at him, his eyebrows were gone. His eyelashes were gone. He was wearing a hat and the hair is all curlicued. And there are blisters on his nose. That's what fire does. But this crew, no hair was singed. Shout now somebody. No hair was singed. The smell of smoke, the smell of smoke was on him for a while. There was no smell of smoke. What did the fire do? All it served to do was consume the ropes that had them in bondage and set them free. When you're in the fire, it'll burn off the bondage. It'll set you free because one like the son of God will be walking by your side in the fire. He's the God who sees and he's the God who saves. That's the Old Testament Jesus. Are you hearing me? I said, that's the Old Testament Jesus. One more story before I need a Gatorade break. Gideon, I love Gideon. You know, Gideon's a character. We talk about putting out a fleece. Do you know why Gideon put out a fleece? He was hoping that the sign would show that what he thought he heard God say wouldn't really be what God wanted. And the first time he puts out the fleece and it's confirmed, he said, nah, let me do this again. Because I don't like this answer. And he does it a second time. So if you put out a fleece, shame on you. Get in your closet and listen for his voice. Hallelujah. That was extra. You don't have to pay for that one. That was extra. So Israel is in a mess. The angel of the Lord comes Sits, um, the angel Lord came and sat down under an oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Aborazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianite. This is hilarious. This angel of the Lord comes and sits down under a tree watching Gideon hiding his harvest from the enemy. Just sits down, relaxed. If God's not worried, you shouldn't be either. Hello? And God's never worried. And so then the angel of the Lord says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Do you know that God can use people who don't see themselves in high regard? He did not see himself as a mighty man of valor. And so he argues with the angel of the Lord. And I'm just telling you, I just can't even imagine this. If an angel appeared, it's in there talking to me and I'm gonna argue with him. But Gideon says, but sir, at least he's respectful. If the Lord is with us, now stop right there. Did the angel of the Lord say, the Lord is with all of you? No. He said, the Lord is with you, Gideon. And Gideon immediately wants to spread that out. Well, if the Lord is with us, that's not what he said. The Lord is with Gideon. Well, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hand of the Midians. Have you ever been in a place that you wanted to say to God, if you're such a good God and you care so much and you love us, why are we in this condition? That's, that's where Gideon is. Don't tell me that I'm a mighty man of valor. Don't tell me that you're with us. How do you explain all of this? And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have. 
and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least of my family. And the Lord said, I will be with you. I will strike down all the Midianites together. I will send you. Who is this God? Now, I wish I had time to preach the whole rest of the story and how God worked out this incredible victory and everything that happened with that. But I just want you to see at the beginning, God called someone who was not qualified and saw themselves as not qualified. But what did he say? He said, I am sending you and I will do the work. Woo, someone should have shouted something right there. That'd have been a good place. We need an amen track or something going on. Thank you. (laughs) Who is the Jesus? The Christophany of the Old Testament. Here's the good news that you get in the Old Testament. I'm telling you that the Old Testament tells me that this Jesus who I serve is a God who sees me, is a God who saves me, and is a God who sends me. When he sees you and saves you, he'll have a purpose for you. And that's the challenge of the Old Testament Jesus to change the world by what he does in us. So where are you this morning? Don't ignore the Old Testament, but my challenge is heads bowed, eyes closed. I feel like God's in the room. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Are you in a place where you feel like God has quit looking your way? He doesn't see you. I believe he's in the house to do something for you this morning. Would you just lift up your hand? Yes, thank you. Anyone else this morning? Yes, thank you. I don't, yes, thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. In the balcony, um, wherever you're online or in the North Chapel, I want to assure you (laughs) that if he saw Hagar, he sees you and he's in the room today to lift you and encourage you. Are you in a battle? and you feel like you're about to be thrown in the fiery furnace of relationship, of work, somewhere else, and there's a storm, a battle that's about to consume you, and you need a reassurance that he's the God who saves, would you lift your hand? Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And some of you have lost your way, and you need to remember he's the God who sends. He has a purpose and a calling for you. And if you need to hear that, would you lift your hand? I need to hear the God who sends. Yes, thank you, thank you, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. And let me remind you, who is that? It's the Jesus of the Old Testament. He sees you. (laughs) He sees you and he will save you. And then he will send you to bring down the strongholds of hell. Could we stand together and just worship the Old Testament Jesus this morning? Let's worship him together.